8th of June, I have a feeling we might need to be a little bit flexible in actually when we do make the presentation and in the form we make we make it. Obviously, it'd be better if we were to um, press the flesh with ministers and to re emphasize our region's advantages right, you know, face to face, so to speak. Today, this is very much an interactive session. So questions and ans questions and comments in the chat room, participating and ans asking questions to our, to our speakers, that will be greatly, greatly appreciated. And there are essentially two parts of it. We will hear from the chief executives of the LEPs across our region first. They will make presentations and then there will be an opportunity for Q&A and comments to them. And then leading on from that, Councillor Linda Hasey, who is chair of the East of England LGA, she will make some general comments from a regional perspective and also invite contributions from that. And finally, um, um, Daniel, jo um, Daniel Johns from Anglian Water will say a few co points to um, map up, to, to sort of to, to wrap things up. And so, and then that will conclude at about 10 past 11, and then we, as I said, we'll move on to the update on the, the vaccination rollout. So I think the first thing is welcome to our three chief executives from our LEPs. What they're going to do is for about seven minutes each, they are going to focus on probably two to three opportunities in their particular areas where, where we, they feel we have a real critical advantage then also highlight um, some of the challenges that we face so as to realise the most of those opportunities and also where they may need some help and support from government or other parties to actually make the most of these opportunities. So that it's going to be, I think, an interesting, um, interesting session. And to kick us off from the LEPs, we've got, um, well, my, my own LEP, the New Anglia LEP, which covers Norfolk and Suffolk, the Chief Executive, um, Chris Starkey, who I know well. Chris is going to kick off and present the, make a presentation on behalf of the New Anglia LEP from Norfolk and Suffolk. Chris, welcome and over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Peter. Uh, thank, you for the, thank, thank you for the welcome. Um, in terms of my seven minutes, I haven't timed this, so let's hope it's going to be seven minutes to perfection so I don't uh, eat into time for questions or, or from uh, uh, LEP colleagues. Um, so um, in, ter in terms of what I'm going to say, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just crack on with it. There aren't any slides, but uh, just imagine, uh, imagine uh, Norfolk and Suffolk uh, and that th those will be your, your backdrop. Um, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic is, uh, has taught us that the pace of change can be significant, change in our economy, um, and, and that's brought challenges and opportunities. And it's perhaps, I think, at a, at a national level and perhaps at our local levels as well, um, has meant that green recovery has been uh, and green growth has been put a little bit to one side. Um, but in, uh, in Norfolk and Suffolk, it's our absolute priority for, for the year upcoming um, and, uh, and central to our local industrial strategy. Uh, and, and we're billing our area, or our part of the east of England is the UK's clean growth region. So it's very timely this session. Um, our two counties, uh, we've got a good track record of working together across the public and private sectors. Um, the LEP and our partners uh, in education, private sector, public sector have led the local economic response to the pandemic, uh, creating our Norfolk and Suffolk economy, economic recovery restart plan and of course the economic intelligence we provide to government on a weekly basis. Um, we're already in terms of the green uh, economy uh, showing clear leadership in a number of the priority areas identified in the government's 10-point plan um, and those opportunities align well with the key three key sector strengths that we've identified in our local industrial strategy uh, those are clean energy uh, agri-food and digital ict um, and um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about those um, and, and highlight, uh, as, as the chairman requested, three, three opportunities and a little bit on the challenges. Uh, in terms of clean energy, uh, the first of our three, uh, three key sectors, uh, Norfolk and Suffolk are already uh, the largest um, uh, offshore wind cluster. 
uh, currently off our shores around 44% of the UK's uh, total install capacity uh, and clean energy uh, offers a huge opportunity uh, in terms of driving forward the green recovery. I um, mean agri-food uh, there are particular opportunities for carbon sequestration the kind of use of land uh, and new crop developments as well as local renewable heat and power generation uh, but large-scale intervention uh, and major investments can be needed to uh, to take forward this sector uh, and our third sector of ICT digital uh, investment in digital infrastructure is critical we've seen uh, significant in investment in the past uh, past year two years three years and so Certainly, uh, that's been critical with home working and so on. Um, and uh, there's an emphasis from our end on increasing digital skills and capabilities. So you have the infrastructure, how do you make, maximize the, the skills and capabilities? Um, and in terms of the green recovery, the significant point source emitters in North Concern surprisingly heavily focused on energy agri-food sector. So there's a great opportunity for us to uh, build back better supporting businesses on the net zero journey. In terms of the, the opportunities, so, uh, so the big opportunities about uh, the existing amount of total installed offshore wind capacity, um, but uh, with the right investment, um, the, there is enough capacity off our shoreline to provide more than 50% of the government's 40 gigawatt target by 2030, uh, and at least 30% of the longer term 75 gigawatt ambition by 2050. Put simply, uh, it's the best place in the UK uh, to develop offshore wind. Um, the offshore wind deal states more than 6,000 well paid skilled jobs will be needed by 2032, uh, many of which will be in our area not just in Norfolk and Suffolk, but the wider east of England as well. In terms of our local delivery, uh, see I call it my co colleague from the Ore Catapult is here today. Uh, the Ore Catapult um, uh, and now has a presence in our region. Uh, and we've uh, uh, running or running the first regional fit for offshore program in our two counties. Uh, we're investing significantly in an o and campus offshore operation, the maintenance campus in Great Yarmouth, uh, the Energy Skills Centre in Lurstoff and a number of other initiatives. Of course it's not just offshore wind, um, nuclear is really important to us, uh, pleased to see uh, colleagues from EDF here today, uh, propose Sizewell C uh, could stimulate the economy and provide jobs during its construction and operation but also uh, a really significant um, opportunity around hydrogen uh, and hydrogen uh, is another uh, key uh, fuel that we're keen to uh, keen to see develop and, uh, and for the east of England to be, become a national and international expert in it. Hydrogen East was launched last summer to develop a viable route map for the development of a hydrogen region. Um, so clean energy is, uh, is so important. Uh, North and Suffolk playing, uh, playing a leading part in this, uh, really important for the east of England, but most importantly for the UK as a whole. The second uh, opportunity is around Freeports. Uh, please see colleagues from Haven Gateway here today. Uh, Freeport East, uh, we submitted our bid uh, last week. Uh, the Freeport East group are made up of businesses, local authorities and uh, two LEPs, our colleagues from the South East LEP as well. Uh, we're calling on the government to assign Freeport status to Felixstowe and Harwich. If Freeport status is granted, uh, will generate a conservative estimate is 13,000 new jobs uh, and about £500 million of investment over five years. Um, the Freeport bid is focused on renewable energy, firstly uh, to stimulate and support the clean energy that I've just, just talked about, uh, hydrogen, offshore wind and nuclear, but also uh, looking to uh, to spearhead the, uh, the 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 approach to carbon zero or net zero, I should say, for ports themselves, uh, particularly shipping. Shipping is a is, is a significant carbon emitter, uh, and this offers a massive opportunity to uh, utilising the biggest port in the UK to to really drive the UK plus the world on uh, decarbonisation of the, uh, the transport sector and shipping in particular. 
third uh, area which is kind of related to that is alternative fuels and pleased uh, that we're going to be working with our colleagues in Cambridge and Peterborough uh, on looking at uh, reduction of carbon emissions from transport uh, and the deployment of alternative fuels in both uh, both Norfolk and Suffolk and across Cambridge and Peterborough as well uh, so important given the uh, the amount of uh, carbon uh, that's emitted through through transport with our relatively rural counties uh, and the final opportunity is uh, something called the decarbonisation academy uh, which uh, is work with, we're undertaking with the energy systems catapult and this is around uh, how do we improve uh, and capitalise on the job opportunities and the skills needs uh, from decarbonisation. So the energy systems catap uh, catapult estimates um, in the millions of homes need to be uh, decarbonised, something like five homes a minute across England to meet net zero by 2050. Uh, the pilot project uh, we're currently developing offers the opportunity with five other pilot areas across England. Um, and the aim is to develop a, a whole skills and training approach to retrofitting housing um, and uh, helping uh, drive forward energy efficient new building. So those are the kind of uh, opportunities we see or uh, short opportunities in the short time I have. In terms of the challenges, I'll be relatively brief on those. Um, there are two related challenges really. One is scale uh, and the second one is collaboration. Um, scale, so significant commitment is needed by partners to deliver on this, turn this ambition in, into reality. Uh, while many are rightly keen to lead in this area, it's going to take a uh, collaborative effort to, uh, to, to deliver at the scale necessary. Um, not one partner owns this agenda, uh, that's partly why we have such a good turnout of, of, of partners today, we all do that, uh, but accountability is critical. Uh, and uh, and I think we need as uh, as an area to collectively establish how we can work together to effectively um, work at the scale uh, that is needed um, and that means uh, there's a role for everyone to play their part um, and the collaborative effort will of course be need to be backed by a significant funding package uh, which of course I think goes to the heart of this group and uh, raising our profile within government uh, and recognising uh, the important role that Norfolk and Suffolk in our case but the wider east of England as my colleagues will, will articulate uh, plays uh, in the UK uh, economy full stop. Uh, I'm going to stop there and uh, hope that I was vaguely near seven minutes. Chris, very many thanks for that and you've set the scene very very well. Um, moving on, next we hear from Hilary Chipping. Hilary is CEO of the South East Midlands Lab. Hilary, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much and thank you very much for inviting me today um, and, and hopefully a lot of what I, I will say um, certainly uh, uh, resonates with uh, what Chris has said and absolutely agree that collaboration is at the heart of a lot of what we're talking about in terms of moving forward with, uh, with, with the green recovery. Um, the South East Midlands covers um, uh, Bedfordshire, Bed Bedford Borough, Central Bedfordshire um, and, uh, and Luton, uh, but also Milton Keynes and Northamptonshire, which are clearly outside your immediate focus. Um, the uh, SEMLEP, the South East Midlands LEP, we've, as, as the other LEPs have been, we've worked on developing uh, our economic recovery strategy um, uh, over the last 10 or 11 months with a, a, a clear focus on green recovery. Uh, and that recovery strategy um, focuses on the um, five foundations of productivity. So we've looked at um, ideas around innovation, people, infrastructure, the transition to zero carbon, buildings and transport, as, as Chris was outlining, the business environment, how we can support our, our businesses to access um, government uh, funding schemes, and a, and a real emphasis on place, um, on, on communities, uh, and, and how we can help those, those places that have been hardest hit as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and we're looking at uh, three phases of recovery in terms of survive, 
stabilize which uh, we're very much in, in, in at the moment and then hopefully into the into the growing period in uh, in 2022 when there'll be a really clear focus on uh, on green recovery and growth and that um, strategy is on on our website and we know that uh, many many businesses are accessing it and uh, and making use of the um, of the funding and other initiatives available i mean in terms of um what, what we mean by um, you know, building back business in, in, in a green way, I would suggest that there are two strands of activity, um, you know, one of which is, is around uh, supporting um, the innovation and, and a lot of what Chris was, was talking about, um, particularly um, around uh, net, net zero aviation, looking at alternative fuels such as hydrogen. Um, and then the other strand is perhaps you know, looking at the um, everyday support for businesses to help them retrofit their their buildings um, you know, installing energy efficient light bulbs all the various many many ways in which we can ensure that that, that, that we carry out our, our, our business in a more energy efficient way um, one of the things that we've sort of picked up from um, uh, through our, our growth hub and our, our business advisors is not surprisingly um, businesses are, are really feeling um, under pressure at the moment there's an awful lot for businesses to cope with um, in terms of the, the pandemic in terms of exiting um, the EU cost pressures planning ahead uh, in terms of uncertainty increasing digital focus um, which which is clearly really important and, and different ways of uh, of working um, working from home will they need their premises in the future all of those issues so I think just a uh, one point that that, that that I would make is that any policy solutions um, that, that, that government uh, are developing really need to be simple and clear and easy to access for businesses I think businesses have, have found it quite difficult sometimes to find sources of funding if they if sometimes it's complicated applications that they need to put together um, all of that can can be a barrier to um, to businesses actually accessing the, uh, the support that, that, that they need and we want them to have and I would say there's a, a very good example um, that, that goes across our area and I think Hertfordshire um, as well um, which is uh, some uh, uh, some ERDF funding um, that uh, is certainly being rolled out by an um, organisation called Engage um, in in our area, um, and uh, the the project is called Low Carbon Workspaces, and, and that provides grants between one and five thousand pounds with match funding. Um, it's a simple application process, and businesses can use that to make their premises more energy efficient. And, and the take up of that is 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 really really good. Um, and what we've done in the SEMLEP area is, is, is try to help businesses um, to access these grants by focusing on the sectors that are particularly important in our area and logistics is, is one of our key sectors and of course as, as part of the pandemic has, has become particularly important as we all uh, work from home shops um, non-essential shops are, are not open we're all ordering a lot more online and so it's it's really important to ensure that both the logistics premises um, and, and the ways in which uh, vehicles are, are, are tra traveling um, are, are more energy efficient um, but the, the other um, issue that, that, that we've come across um, is that sometimes the the incentives um, to become more energy efficient aren't really hitting home with the right people so for example if if you're a business that's that's renting premises you know you're, you're you might not find it um, particularly cost effective to invest in making the, the premises more energy efficient um, it's the landlords that, that that need to do that and sometimes they're locked into um, with particular energy providers or on particular tariff arrangements and so they don't that that, that incentive to um, reduce um, uh, use of energy which will come through in terms of lower bills sometimes isn't striking home uh, in the right place so we think it's uh, it's something that government um, perhaps could give some thought to how to create those incentives um, to, to address the, the, the needs of who's actually going to benefit. And this is I mean, this, this is a, a well known issue across all um, and energy uh, usage, often upfront um, investment in, in making uh, a building energy efficient um, is it has to be taken on board by the, the developer, uh, then uh, the, uh, the, 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 the um, business 
business that, that actually take, takes over the building or it could it could be a, a home as well uh, they benefit from the reduced energy bills so getting that incentive to strike home in the right place I think is something that's, that, that we need to look at further with, with the help of government. Um, the other issue that, um, that, that we've come across across, um, across our, our, our patch is that um, it, it would be really good if there were better mechanisms for sharing energy. So for example, we developed an energy strategy a couple of years ago now, um, and, it, and it became really apparent that there are some parts of um, our South East, East Midlands uh, economy um, where it, there really isn't any more capacity uh, at the moment for electric for further um, generation of, uh, of energy. And um, but in other other parts of, uh, of the area, um, businesses say they don't need the full capacity that, that they have. So we, you know, th there's a risk that we're um, we're not enabling um, the the growth in terms of commercial premises and uh, and new homes to, to be built necessarily in, in the places that's best for uh, the environment and for communities because of the restrictions around um, energy capacity um, and clearly that there, there's technology available um, that, that would enable um, uh, businesses to be allocated power on, on a much more nuanced basis and to be able to share power with, with the grid uh, and, and, um, and, and, and could be provided with more support in terms of getting the technology that they need. Uh, and that's, I think, particularly important um, in terms of getting the appropriate commercial contracts in place. And I think that's something that maybe we in government could look at a bit more how we can how we can share energy how we can control demand so that we don't necessarily need to um, supply that additional capacity in particular locations which as as every as we all know can be really expensive and difficult to to do with the existing uh, regulatory system um, in, in place there's a lot of exciting things going on in, in the South East Midlands uh, at the moment, and we're particularly uh, linking up across the Oxford to Cambridge arc. So um, SEMLEP, Oxford Shell Local Enterprise Partnership, Cambridge to Peterborough Combined Authority Business Board, um, and, uh, and, and colleagues um, uh, further south in, in Buckinghamshire are part of the, the government's, what the government is calling the Oxford to Cambridge arc. And we published um, an economic prospectus uh, in, in October, which, which really set out um, the aspiration to have innovation um, led growth with a, with a lot of emphasis on, for example, um, striving towards net zero aviation. And we have Cranfield um, at university with its own research airport right in the middle of, of the South East Midlands um, and there's a lot of work going on there around the move to um, electric aviation and use of, uh, of hydrogen. Uh, we also have um, just just a few I'll uh, just run through a few examples um, uh, there's, there's something called the uh, uh, Chalveston um, uh, Green Energy Park which is in East Northamptonshire uh, and that's at the moment that's a, a wind uh, and solar farm and it's already um, it's, it covers a site of about 300 hectares uh, and, and it's generating about 80 megawatts of, of renewable energy but it's also um, looking at battery storage and developing hydrogen fuel cells so a lot of exciting uh, um, activity going on uh, in that part of, of North Northamptonshire and working again with the um, with Cranfield University so what what I think we see um, in the South East Midlands and across the Oxford to Cambridge arc is, is this real opportunity um, for collaboration so you know we, we've got uh, uh, um, engineers and, and, and other uh, researchers uh, from Oxford from Cambridge joining up at, at Cranfield um, to solve some of these really challenging issues around um, how we can uh, move to particularly decarbonizing transport which is one of the one of the biggest challenges um, at the moment. Um, up in again up in Northamptonshire uh, we have an organization called Electric Corby um, and uh, they've been doing a lot of, um, over a number of years now, um, leading um, community scale um, demonstrator projects. So uh, around low carbon living, um, around uh, uh, transportation, um, you know, use, using electric vehicles, and then using the batteries in terms of storage to even out the, uh, the, the demand and supply for electricity on a, on, on a local basis. 
uh, and they've got they're using a number of um, uh, smart uh, smart technology systems in order to do that and they're also working with businesses um, and then uh, logistics I, I as, as I mentioned earlier logistics is, is hugely important um, in, in, in the Northamptonshire Bedfordshire area in particular uh, and we've got a number of, of organizations like Prologis um, who I mean they they uh, um, submitted a, a response to um, the low carbon buildings white paper so maybe the, the perhaps the, the more traditional view of the logistics in industry um, is uh, it, it is perhaps changing with an emphasis on how to make their um, their, their commercial premises uh, net, net carbon as well as looking at, at the vehicles um, tra traveling around so just to conclude now in terms of um, where I think you know government can can, can really help us uh, I think I think you know, funding is, is always important but it's not just about funding I think as, 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 as I think Chris summed it up really well we need the collaboration I think in this area we're demonstrating that collaboration some exciting projects already in train but that support from from government particularly um, things like that you know the the, the uh, greater use of hydrogen that that new technology and innovation I think it would be great to have more support from government on that and then I think also um, around the big strategic infrastructure projects um i mean you know we have we have east west rail um gradually moving moving across uh, towards uh, bedford and cambridge w wouldn't it be great if we were going to have um, electric trains on that railway we can then access have access across to, to the ports i mean we're very much supporting um the uh, the, the free port initiative that, that that chris mentioned um the uh, uh, the vehicles that come through uh, out of felix though travel across the A14 through our, our, our patch and it's really really important that we can um, do our do our best to ensure that uh, the energy use, usage in that particular sector um, is really based on renewables as much as possible. So I'll finish. Hillary, up. Many, Hillary, many many thanks for that and I think you have emphasised how much as a region we do have to work to have great opportunities working together as you said particularly in the logistics you highlighted the logistics sector with the freeport bid so very many thanks for doing that and for giving us that very helpful insight um moving on next our final let presenter is the ceo from the hertfordshire let which is neil hayes neil welcome thank you chair uh, i will deviate from the format and add a few slides if i may appreciate that we are push for time but so in, in terms of the overall picture on where we are in terms of resilience and recovery Hertfordshire has suffered like other places but our fundamentals I think are strong and I think in in the time where we are looking to the future it's building on those fundamentals I think is really important for us as a region as well as a, our, our local economy in Hertfordshire so you know, our proximity to London and airports, the connectivity, the skills base that we have. But I think some of these assets will need to transition. I think some of those skill sets that we have will need to transition to new sectors. I think we have to recognise that the pattern of travel will change. Uh, and an economy such as ours, where a third of our working population historically commuted into London, there are fundamental shifts that we are beginning to consider. Uh, like um, my other colleagues, we produced a recovery plan, um, uh, and again, I think many of the things are similar, similar to what Hillary and Chris were talking about. But you know, the the essential package in the middle is around identifying those key innovation assets that we have. I'll talk about those a bit in a bit shortly. I think the whole skills and creativity of our workforce again is an asset but i think there are challenges in terms of moving some of that skills in from sectors that are in decline to sectors that are in growth a particular issue in hertfordshire is around kind of international trade and investment that historically we've done very well out of this without if i'm honest trying too hard i think there needs to be a renewed focus about promotion of hertfordshire as an investment location with the renewed vigor that um, we haven't had in the past and increasingly we're working within our, our, our local uh, authority partners in the, in the confines of a growth, growth board uh, over the past 18 months and we also believe that you know the the economy uh, and jobs etc are going to be more of an intrinsic part of place shaping so how does jobs going back into some of those town centers as opposed to matching the decline in retail how does that work 
um, and connectivity. I talked about the, the changes in terms of remote working. Um, actually, uh, I actually think Hertfordshire is behind some of the other parts of the east of England in terms of next generation digital connectivity. Our, our super fast fibre connectivity is good, but when we come to um, you know uh, next generation fibre, I, I, I think there's a lot of work that we need to do in relation to that. So whilst the economy is kind of in crisis, what we're, we're trying to do is, is, is just re reflect on some of that and then build long-term plans in terms of where we should be focusing. So the fundamental side, so refreshing our skills strategy and our enterprise strategy to kind of build back differently. We know, and this is not unique to Hertfordshire, that young people are taking the biggest hit in terms of the economy. That sort of 16 to 24 uh, element of the workforce are, are just not being able to enter the job market as is. So they're more likely to go into FE and HE. So how can we make sure that when they come out of that, Possibly additional educational uh, setup. They're 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 into future facing jobs. We've got like um, my colleagues, you know, particular assets and skills that's that we want to build on. Um, in our part of the world, we have a very strong creative sector. So we have like, Warner Brothers Studios, BBC, Elstree Studios, and even in the middle of this uh, downturn, we've had an announcement of investment from Sky and NBC Universal for brand new studio space which is around two billion pounds worth of an impact of our local economy. And this is a sector that's reaching a critical mass uh, and we need to make sure that the ecosystem around it can grow. So that skills throughput, how do we transition people into this sector that are potentially in financial services or marketing, etc. cetera. Um, likewise, cell and gene therapy, we've spent 10 years as a lap investing in the cell and gene campus um, on the back of the GSK site in um, Stevenage. That is now world leading on cell and gene therapies, uh, which is very pertinent in the current climate. And I think there's a, there's a real issue about growing that cluster and allowing it to spread out beyond that initial campus development into other parts of the east of England. Uh, we, we were already, uh, it's overheating in terms of land demand. Um, so that there's, 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 there's a sort of message here around kind of allowing some of these uh, sectors to build around ecosystems and grow even further and the third you know, third and fourth around sort of manufacturing um, we have an enterprise zone that's built around envirotech it's called hearts iq um, and our particular kind of green assets again we are we're obviously not going to be home of uh, renewable offshore energy but we have particular excellence in sustainable construction we have the building research establishment here in hertfordshire looking at ways about you know, we're still going to have to build homes. How do we use off-site construction techniques? We have also a, a, the existing construction sector is heavily featured in Hertfordshire. I think most of the headquarters of the UK are based in and around our location. How do we help them move from the old bricks and mortar house building to new methods of construction that would create future jobs? Uh, and so these are kind of jobs that would be more like manufacturing and assembly jobs as opposed to sort of traditional construction. How do we build that economy? How do we service the job, the housing demand, not only within the east of England, but you know, our near neighbours as well, and build a sector? And then also in other elements of Envirotech, we have assets such as uh, the Rothenstead Research that we have uh, helped build, again, an ecosystem, creating space for, grow on space for companies to, to, to reach a critical mass. So I think that, again, the theme of today is that asset base, connecting our various assets that we've got with, across that geography to help them grow and actually help some of those ecosystems feed off each other. Um, the, the other element we're getting into is uh, foundations for growth. And again, these themes are, are not unique, clearly, to Hertfordshire, but it's more looking at these um, foundations as fundamentals rather than add-ons to what we would develop in our normal economic plan. So in terms of low carbon, it's how do we, how do we sort of weave that into the fiber of, of our plans for the future rather than that being something as, a, as an afterthought and in, uh, an inclusive growth. We've, we've recognized that some of our places in Hertfordshire has been relatively resilient. Those commuter towns that have been able to work from home have been, those that haven't have suffered significantly and will, will do so. So that, that inclusive growth needs to work. So, you know, the, the, the huge assets we're building, where's the connection with the local population being able to benefit from those, I think is a real challenge for us. Um, I, I, I guess we're still, in terms of asks, I think we're still, the, the challenge is in, you know, the diversity is a key strength 
both for Hertfordshire and East of England, but how do you capture that and reflect that back in a coherent way, I think is really important. Um, I, I think it's time giving ourselves, and I think the platforms like this are really useful to give ourselves the time to think about how we build back in the long term. I think those propositions around kind of digital and low carbon, also the opportunities that we have as a region to unlock private sector investment, possibly more than other regions of the country is really, really important. So building that collaboration, uh, and I think the elephant in the room, you know, there are there is the challenge around levelling up, is remains a challenge for us, and I think it's not a kind of me too argument, but it's it's demonstrating that investment can can leverage significant private sector investment, and I'll just leave you with a this is a um, a stat I picked yesterday. The NAO were just looking at the distribution of industrial strategy challenge funds, so that's a fund that came out. 2017 to 2020 and you see on the chart uh, at the bottom you know the east of england had seven percent of the allocated fund in a very innovative region um we are getting less than a quarter of what the southeast region is getting and less than half of both london and and the west midlands surely there's something that needs to be done in, in this area why and it may well be that we as LEPs need to do more. You know, I, I'm not not claiming I know the answer, but I think this is indicative of the kind of the need for us to kind of up our game and be more visible and, and secure greater resources. And I, I'll stop there. Hopefully that was within time. Neil, very many, many thanks for that. And I will just slightly divert from our agenda and so as to allow more time for q and I will just um, ask Linda, um, Linda Hasey, from the, um, from, who's chair of the East of England Local Government Association, Linda, just to quickly say a few words on what you've heard from across the, the LEPs in the region, so as to very much draw the, the whole thing together um, before we invite others to, um, you know, have make their their feedback and observations. Linda, Absolutely. over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think what I'd like to do, Chairman, if I may, is um, send round the words that I had proposed to say, which was pulling it all together so that everyone can see how it is all being drawn together. Um, so therefore, I'm not going to say anything which uh, I had planned to say. So this is um, spontaneously and off the cuff. I think we are a very innovative area. We're a very diverse area, um, which as we have always said, is our strength, but also in many areas, our weakness. We are leading in so many of these areas and we have to make sure that those leads and that leadership is recognized. Um, and this is what this APPG and other uh, areas like this is all about. I think there were um, two words that came out. One is collaborative and the other one is accountable. Now collaborative we all recognize if we're going to do this we have to do it together. No one is an island particularly around here at the moment although it's pretty wet um, and I think we the only way to achieve things is actually to say right what can I do, what can you do, let's not lock horns over it, let's actually look at what is achievable for our residents. Because again, being a politician, the most important thing is the quality of life for our residents. And everything we do uh, as politicians, as LEPs, and hopefully with all of you in business, that's your main ambition. We know there are many challenges and those have to be overcome. Accountable. Now again, that is where the politician comes in politicians are accountable and if we don't succeed the electorate boots us out so again i think we have to work together to make sure that somehow that accountability is recognized that it's not just the politicians who have to push this and take the take it in the neck when it goes wrong um, but actually we all have a degree of responsibility so please take away collaborative we're good at that accountable let's make sure we are all accountable for our actions in this area our residents want to see us all be green there's been an enormous shift in thought uh, processes over the last uh, one to two years and green is very much up the agenda um, so let's work together and uh, i know we can achieve it the east of england is a great area it's a great area to live a great area to work um, and we have to make it even better Thank you. 
Linda, very many thanks for, for summing that up so well. And really, can I now invite um, feedback and comments from, our, from, our, from others to, to, to get their perspective on what has been said? Um, I think I would just make one point from here is that it's very easy um, when one's looking, say, at the Freeport bid around Felix Stowe and Harridge to just focus completely on that area. But as we heard, it actually impacts the whole region. And with the logistics, as um, Hillary was saying, the logistics industry being so important in the Western part of our region, clearly they have a role to play there. And likewise, we focus on the nuclear nuclear industry, the offshore wind in in, in the eastern part of the region, but then there are innovative plans um, we hear about of, of using in energy, whether it's um, in Corby or in the energy part that um, Hillary outlined. And then I think that Neil has outlined that there is other industries that we have skills in, in Hertfordshire, but there are, we are in danger of overheating. And actually we can, we, we can use, make, take full advantage of that skills that set that's been built up in other parts of the region. So that's just a few things I've taken from what we've heard this morning. Um, other thoughts and comments, please. <clears throat> Any suggestions, anyone? Yeah, Peter, Peter sorry, I had to put my hand up. My name David, is- My apologies. Um, so I'm David Hunt from Gleeds. Um, it's, it's a question rather than a thought and a comment, and that is how do we collaborate and come together in a way that allows us to create a unified voice to those who've got significant um, investment flows. So in the Midlands, they've created the Midlands engine. We know what's we know the success that's happened up in Manchester. But um, at the moment, just as you were saying just there, Peter, we, we've got lots of great ambition and we've got lots of energy and there are good things happening. But how do we create that East of England um, energy centre, tech centre that is a rival or can complement what's happening with the ARC? So this is the Camox ARC or the London Stansted Cambridge Consortium. Um, and how do, we, how do we resurrect what we're was started with the NEGC, North, North Essex Garden Community, um, where they were setting out an, a very ambitious plan to build 50,000 homes over a significant period, but in doing so would have attracted quite a lot of investment from MHCLG and the like. So it's a, it's a question about unifi unifying our energy. Um, can I just, David, many, many thanks for that. Can I just ask very quickly the three um, CEOs from the LEPs just for um, their perspective on that? You know, I'm quite sure they, um, you know, this isn't the first time that they've met this morning and they do collaborate and just get their perspective on what's maybe working well in terms of collaboration, but what would help to make, make, that, make, us, make, them, make us work better together? So, you know, in no particular order, um, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, look, I think one of, one of the challenges is the, uh, is the diversity uh, and the geography of the East of England. Um, and, and also government ambition around particular regions. So the Midlands engine was a government construct uh, which the uh, which partners across LEPs local authorities have have sort of got behind, uh, and to be honest, if your government puts a million, couple of million quid behind a project, then that's quite a good incentive for uh, for partners to mobilise behind it. I think I think as an example of their MIPIM stand, which um, uh, uh, was uh, was should we say considerably funded by by central government. Um, can we do something on, on our own on our own back? Well, the Oxcam arc, I think, is proof of that. But but the geography on that is defined. It doesn't cover the whole of the east of England. It covers a bit of the east of England, some of the southeast, some of the west of England, uh, or, or south southwest. Um, and 
so so and and is there sense in having something on the, uh, across the east of england well my sense is there is uh, had mipim happened this year there would have been the first decent sized presence from the east of england for a number of years uh, that was built up through collaboration between the uh, between the arc the um uh the stansford corridor uh the uh uh, Essex uh, garden villages that you, you referred to, uh, plus ourselves. So, so I think there's certainly the willingness and the appetite to do it. Um, one of the challenges is the is the kind of political constructs that have been created by uh, uh, by the civil service and by ministers, which have have made the East of England collaborating slightly harder. Um, that that's just kind of my personal take on it, really, rather than uh, rather than official position of our lab. Yes, many, many thanks for that. And um, Hilary, any thoughts? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I, th I think Chris is, uh, has really sort of put his finger on one of the issues that we're all um, grappling with at the moment. Um, government has some views about parts of the country that, that, that um, they perhaps think will work together effectively, like the Midlands um, and the Oxford to Cambridge Arc, which we're, you know, ha ha from an MHCLG point of view has, has a defined um, geography. I, I would suggest that um, you know we, we we certainly can look beyond that. I mean, as as LEPs, we, we work very closely with them, um, uh, with, with Chris um, and Neil, where it makes sense. And, and hopefully, you know, you heard this morning how how well what each of us said um, came together. And we haven't sort of rehearsed that. It's because we do, you know, we we, we know uh, each other's areas quite well, and we know when when it helps to. Um, to, to collaborate, uh, I think there's a you know there, there, there's a great complexity at the moment around um, various geographies. I mean, England's economic heartland, for example, um, covers Hertfordshire uh, uh, as well as the Arkan uh, and Swindon, and that's you know, doing a, a fantastic job um, developing uh, a transport uh, transport strategy and doing a lot of work around decarbonisation. So, I think my what what I would say is try not to get too sort of um you know, pulled into them into the mire of, of of which particular uh geography may or may not be recognized by government or funded by government at any particular time i think it's so much more important for us to work together and and really identify these huge opportunities because um everything that we're talking about in in terms of of a green recovery is very much in line with um the overall government strategy and I and I think if we can demonstrate that you know we can we can collaborate uh, across the east of England across across the wider art whatever geographies make sense um, and then hopefully you know the important thing is to get that investment into the area um, and uh, as, as, as Councillor Hazy said to actually demonstrate to our communities that, that, that you know, we, we, by working together we can make things better for them and for uh, future communities. Linda, very many thanks for that. And Neil? Uh, just to echo those comments, really, I, I, think, I think there's you know, a legitimate challenge you could put to LEPS that we should take up around collaboration. I think uh, we're obviously very focused on localities uh, and delivering what we can there. But And there is a kind of sideshow around regional structures and governance that which was ever thus, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But I. You know, it, if we looked at the kind of the, the, the adage of form follows function, we all have various assets. So I, I think, is it beyond the wit of us as a group of LEPs to sort of, uh, you know, have lead and support functions around particular sector or policy areas uh, and, and work collaboratively on that base? So we just talked about the diversity of those growth sectors across the east of England. Maybe there's some areas that we take a lead on on behalf of our colleagues in the east of England and vice versa. So I do think there's opportunity in that, that kind of removes some of the kind of incessant governance and structures uh, around working with the asset base and the business base in the, in, the, in the region. Many, many thanks for that, Neil. And Linda, I think you probably did want to come back in in response to what David's, David's question. Yes, if I may. Um, for example, in Hertfordshire, the 11 leaders of the county and the districts and boroughs spent 18 months working together to create the Hertfordshire Growth Board. Cross-party, different ambitions, but we all knew that by working together we would end up with a better offer for all our residents across Hertfordshire by going to when we went to government. We are now an official growth board uh, and we are well recognised with the MHCLG. So I think if there is the political will and again, I come back to the politics of 
of it. It has to be the political will to make this work. The LEP is a member of the Hearts Growth Board and a very important one because it brings um, the, the business uh, and the businesses on board with that. So I think again, um, perhaps we can, uh, sort of talking with Cheryl, the Chief Exec of ELGA, perhaps we can start playing around with some ideas as to how we can find areas where collaboration actually will create things which we cannot even by just talking like this actually achieve separately. Linda, very many thanks for that and I've now got um, questions for um, people looking to come in, the two Daniels. First of all Daniel Johns from Anglian Water and then I'm delighted to say that my um, co-chair Daniel Zeichner has joined us and so he will be um, relieving me at, um, for, the next, for the next session. So um, Daniel Johns first. Daniel, over to you. Thank you, Peter. I just want to say that was a really interesting discussion. And I think if there is, if there is a way to bring together the kind of politics of East, of East of England, I think that has to be uh, to benefit of everybody. But just uh, say, if I can spend a couple of minutes giving you all an update on our own green recovery plans at Anglian Water. Obviously, we cover the whole uh, region, certainly in terms of supplying water and wastewater. Um, and I presented before, I think, to this group, our green recovery five point plan back in September which uh, made a whole number of commitments around achieving net zero, uh, nature recovery, climate change adaptation, but also increasing skills and opportunities and job creation across the region. Um, we're into almost into our second year of a five year business plan. It's the biggest ever business plan we've delivered, 6.5 billion pounds. Uh, we've also uh, sought extra funding and financing from the Competition and Markets Authority. This is a process that's been rumbling on in the background all year. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we've submitted our final evidence to the CMA and we'll hear by the end of February in terms of the conclusion of that appeal. And obviously that's important because our, our case to the CMA is that we weren't allowed sufficient investment to tackle uh, the climate change challenge and the nature crisis. And we hope the CMA will, will find our evidence compelling and allow us to, to invest even more uh, in the region uh, without increasing bills. And that's important to say that even with the record investment we're putting forward, water bills will still be falling in real terms. And just to put that into context, for this next 12 month period, we're investing a record 630 million pounds whilst also delivering a 12 pound reduction in bills. Uh, so that means for the average household about one pound 16 on their water bill each day. We were also delighted to hear before Christmas from the Environment Secretary, George Eustace, that he has approved our request to accelerate 300 million pounds of investment in, uh, in nature recovery. So these are an additional 200 specific nature interventions to restore rivers, and in particular to take forward another 34 treatment wetlands, like the one we have at Ing Inglesthorpe in West Norfolk. So this is a natural gravity fed system of uh, reed beds and lagoons which, which clean wastewater before, uh, say, an Ingalls thought case being uh, released back into the environment in the local chalk stream. So it, we will be ramping up that activity and there's plenty of scope to collaborate in the delivery of those schemes. For example, you know, that first scheme was delivered with the Norfolk Rivers Trust and we'll be looking to work with Rivers Trusts and Wildlife Trusts across the region to deliver uh, that investment. Uh, we also launched in November, uh, we were one of three companies who sponsored Water UK's Net Zero uh, route map. So this is the first example anywhere in the world where a, a whole sector has come together to deliver a route map in a, a credible way to achieve net zero by 2030. Uh, we're now working with the COP26 team as part of the Race to Zero, obviously looking ahead to Glasgow uh, later on this year. Uh, we've signed a major so uh, solar uh, and storage framework contract. Uh, we completed our biggest ever solar farm at Grafham uh, last September. And we'll have another 100 sites, uh, you know, rolling out solar across our operational sites over the next kind of two years. Again, another, another 100 sites or so. Uh, this week is also National Apprenticeship Week, which I'm sure hasn't escaped your notice. Uh, water companies obviously have big apprenticeship schemes, and we ourselves have uh, put forward another 40, uh, 40 opportunities uh, to come forward in this, this year. Uh, and back to the kind of net zero plans, uh, you may have seen in the press that we're working with low carbon farming and Oast House Ventures to build two absolutely massive greenhouses, uh, one just outside uh, Barry St Edmunds and one in Norwich, uh, to grow about 10%, I think, of the UK tomato crop uh, year round, warmed uh, by waste heat captured from one of our uh, water recycling centres. So it's a really innovative project where we're you know, thinking in circular economy terms to capture waste heat, 
to use it to grow tomatoes to increase food security and those tomatoes will have a 75 percent lower uh, carbon footprint so i just wanted to kind of emphasize that you know, perhaps uh, the, the green recovery covid obviously everybody is focusing on on the here and now making sure the vaccine program works as well as it can uh, supporting our customers supporting our staff but we're also in the background you know, getting on with the investments that we need to create the jobs and hopefully recover uh, the east of England in a much more kind of sustainable way, I suppose, uh, in the months and years ahead. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Daniel, very many thanks for setting out what and what you're doing across the region. Daniel's like now. Daniel, can I bring you in, please? You, you can, Peter. Good morning, everybody. And um, uh, the the event I was uh, that clashed for me meant was cancelled, which meant I've been listening very closely this morning. So. Um, before I take over from you, Peter, as, as a as a non-controversial chair, I just wanted to lob in some controversial questions to our panellists. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to say thank you to, to, to Daniel for the work that Anglia Water are doing, and, and I did reference their recovery plan during the passage of the Environment Bill. But my question um, uh, is, what is it exactly we're recovering from? Because I think it's a kind of assumption um, in many of the speakers, and probably many of us, that the big thing we're recovering from is COVID. Let me just be slightly controversial and say that I was listening to some economists the other day who were predicting that the bounce back from COVID will be relatively quick um, and relatively successful. I'm afraid, and this is controversial, the much more difficult bounce back will be from Brexit, where the predictions from some now are that we're going to see 5-6% um, fall in GDP over the next few years. And my question to all of the, the speakers is particularly around the skills issues. Are we going to be losing um, skilled people? Are we going to be losing non-skilled people? What assessment has been done of workforce requirements across our region? I speak also as the shadow um, agriculture minister, and I think there are real concerns about the, the agricultural workforce. So I suppose my question to Lept is, what kind of workforce assessment are you doing and what do we require? Daniel, very many, many thanks for that. Um, any of our Lep Chief Executives want to have a go on that. Neil, would you like to um, kick off? Yes, sir, I'll make, I'll make a start. Um, in relation to skills, we are in the middle of unpicking all of that, uh, if I'm honest, where we're, we, are, we are trying to determine whether our existing kind of strategies and approaches to skills and workforce development are, are, are whether they've been fundamentally affected or not. Uh, and it, it, it is very hard to determine at this point in time. And I think there's a danger of, of of trying too hard to second guess the future on some of this some of this stuff. Um, I, I, you know, I go back to just in our economy's terms, you know, those sort of fundamentals around sort of workforce, around uh, locations, around sort of a good spread of uh, growth sectors is what's important. And um, you know, having very precise assets are great. Um, but it's the ability to grow those uh, and, and then see a supply chain come out of it or um, other jobs. So I, I'll give you a good example in the kind of the cell and gene uh, cluster that's up in Stevenage. It isn't about, you know, PhD students with in lab coats. It's about the manufacture of uh, the devices, et cetera, that's coming out of the, in the innovation that, that, that's where the demands are. So that is kind of technical skills. So the conversation we'll have with the cell and gene catapult up there is, well, what, have, what can we do with the apprenticeship program to, to, to sort of tweak and design with FE and the University of Hertfordshire a set of um, skills outcomes that kind of meet your needs? The challenge with that, with skills, and I probably sound like a bit of a crap record, is most of the levers are national. You have very little control of what you can do locally. Uh, and I have some concerns with the white paper the ability to go and recognize that uh, if, if I'm honest so the ability to sort of have some resource to co-design and tailor skills programs that meet very particular local needs is very is very challenging um, but um, I do think the other issues are there are a bunch of sort of characteristics coming into the COVID-19 pandemic we were struggling with as a place and they haven't gone away you know, we were struggling to employ people in the health and care sector. Retail was in decline. So these things were not, you know, they weren't exclusive to COVID. And I think, you know, we can get, we can, you can draw a line and you can see where some of these things have impacted for a number of years. All COVID has done is accelerate them. So 
in uh, one uh, colleague from the development industry I was talking about was, you know, he's, some of these things have just been fast forwarded five years. So we just have to get on and re respond to them. Um, um, and, and, and so it, 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 I think it's a careful recalibration of what we need, not necessarily kind of huge fundamental um, uh, policy shift or change. Um, uh, but having, and it's not about funding, it's about the ability to have those levers, the ability to kind of work with the various partners you've got in a local area and collectively uh, have, the, have the ability to intervene locally at scale um, as a response. That, in relation to skills, that's always been a challenge, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass on to my colleagues for, for other comments. Many thanks, Neil. And Hilary, any quick observations? Thanks. Yeah, and, and I very much agree with a lot of what Neil has, has been saying. I mean, we, we've been developing for a number of years now uh, an employer-led skills strategy. So we do a lot of analysis of um, opportunities in the area and actually you know, where our, our, our young people um, will be able to uh, obtain the right sorts of skills for the jobs available. And we, um, uh, and we do, we, we have um, people going into schools explaining, you know, for example, the logistics sector for, for a lot of young people, that doesn't mean a great deal. Um, and perhaps may even have some negative connotations. But when you start to talk about the exciting um, opportunities and particularly requiring uh, digital skills and then I think that, that enthusing of young people and then giving them information about the career paths to follow is, is as important as it ever was. Um, I think there you know, we, we've uh, during the, the, the pandemic we've had really close links um, with our schools we've, uh, and with our colleges um, doing a, a lot of um, uh, on uh, ensuring that, that some people uh, that, that, that young people and other people needing to reskill um, to take advantage of the jobs that are becoming available particularly more in, in, in the health sector uh, that those online opportunities are available so I think digital skills will continue to be really really important um, I think uh, also uh, not there's not so much emphasis now on necessarily employers all wanting degree level qualifications it's more around the competencies that that, that, that people have in their uh, employability so we will be focusing on on ensuring that those opportunities are, are available I mean clearly uh, you know the um, unemployment uh, it, it, is going to be a, a, a really challenging issue and particularly for for young people uh, as we move out of lockdown but i think just one positive point to end on we we've been seeing a lot of businesses um having really innovative and exciting and interesting ideas and perhaps uh, the businesses that we see coming out of the pandemic won't be the same have the same dependence on the hospitality and retail sector um, there are other opportunities and what we've been talking about uh, this morning so skills in terms of of um, be, being able to uh, um, bring uh, commercial premises and other, uh, and other uh, developments up to high energy standards that will be a really important skill for the future Many, many thanks for that. And on cue, Neil has posted in the chat room a link to what is being done in Stevenage. Um, do you want to quickly elaborate on that, Neil? Yes, it, it, just, it just took a call that I, I forgot. I should have mentioned it. We, we actually facilitated a discussion where we got major employers, so GSK, Airbus, etc., and some of those people on that campus. Uh, worked with local schools and the local authority to try and do some of that practical brokerage to try and actually uh, target it towards young people and their parents and teachers actually about the opportunities that are on your doorstep because yeah and it, it sounds very obvious but it doesn't happen a lot and I think where you can capture that at, at the right place and the right geography I think it's been really tangible and, and we've had fantastic feedback from it both from employers and from young people just and it's generated a lot of interest and lead and there's been a lot of take up in terms of apprenticeships on the back of it so it's not it's not perfect but I think again it's in the area of sharing collaboration it's an example of where you know LEPs and partners can can play that brokerage role. Peter I'm uh, um, keen to answer Daniel's um, well really, yeah. really as I would expect really good questions um, and um, I, I think I, I have to say you're an optimist if you think uh, the economy is going to recover from COVID quickly. Um, the OBR stats don't look 
don't look great in terms of getting back sort of 2024 perhaps back to back to where we were um, at a kind of longer term structural changes to the economy um, Brexit absolutely we've modeled the Brexit impact it's not it's not good I think it would be a brave person to say uh, the economy will be stronger as a result of the trade deal um, flying in the face of uh, flying in the face of facts but I think um, I think everyone knew that so so yeah and and the third the third piece is the kind of issues issues weaknesses struck opportunities in our sector so our build back plan is from that so it's 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 an it's it's a mix of the three things I think COVID is probably just this is, is the kind of shorthand really for that so so our recovery plan is how do we get back to a, a growth trajectory how do we focus on the inclusive growth productivity and green growth that we were that we were looking at before we have recalibrated our economic strategy and our local industrial strategy had a look at are there any fundamental changes that we would like to make um, the answer is probably not given what Neil said before is that the, in a sense, uh, what COVID has done is created, is exacerbated and accelerated some of the opportunities and the structural weaknesses. So it's kind of fast forwarded what we needed to focus on before, um, I think. Um, and, and to repeat those, inclusive growth, uh, digitization, productivity, um, and, and clean growth um, are our kind of, our, our four things. I think Neil and Hillary would agree those are, those are common themes for, for all of us. In terms of skills, really interesting. The white paper um, um, is is interesting. Uh, we are, uh, along with fellow LEPs, um, we all have set up skills advisory panels, employer-led skills advisory panels, uh, to a to a LEP across the country, to a DfE uh, prescription, uh, which they seem to be wanting to rewrite now in the in the white paper. It would have been nice if they'd allowed us to publish our skills plans before they changed them. However, uh, we are where we are, uh, and we are um, uh, and we are due to publish our our skills plan uh, which will be in a sense a bit of a stock take and assessment of where we are Daniel so I th think answering some of your points will it come up with all the solutions no uh, but it will certainly be looking at we've developed sector skills plans for our key sectors eight or nine of our sectors and what we need to do is drill down to a bit more detail on what does that really mean to the uh, to the average um, young person or older person either in employment or or in college and so on and I would agree with Neil's point. Some of the levers are national levers, uh, and uh, it is quite frustrating. And I think our college, uh, college principals, university principals, would agree that if we had more uh, wiggle room at a local level uh, to work with the nuance and the slight differences between our different uh, different areas, uh, our, our, the skill system would work a, a lot better. Because skills is definitely not a one size fits all across the east of England, let alone uh, England as a whole. That's very many thanks for that. And I see we have ticked on to two minutes past um, 11.10 when this session is meant, is, was meant to have finished. And Tiffany Hemming is here to give us an update on the COVID vaccination across the region. But I'll just draw things to a conclusion by thanking everyone for thanking our um, four speakers for their contributions for, I think, sort of um, opening up a few sort of ideas. I think the collaboration is something that it has come out very clearly out of this out of this session. We'll we'll home in on connectivity at the next one, and um, to just thank you all for your presentations. Plenty of food for thought, and Daniel, I'll now hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much, Peter. And let's go go straight to Tiffany. Uh, obviously, it's huge interest across the region on how the vaccination program is going. Um, Tiffany, perhaps you can bring us up to date. Hello, yes, thank you for inviting me. So, as you know, we are delivering vaccine across the east of England and have been doing so. We're now in the 10th week. It feels like a lot longer, but we've only been doing it for 10 weeks. We are on track to hit our anticipated target for the week, which is around 1.48 million people that we think are in cohorts one to four. We've been delivering through hospital hubs, uh, through local vaccination services, which are made up of a single PCN site within a PCN, that's a primary care network. We've got 152 PCNs across the region, and together they have formed 133 sites. And on top of that, we've currently got 17 community pharmacy sites open, some of whom are really quite large. We also have vaccination centres that continue to open, 
across the region. The way we do that is we identify sites, we take them through a very rigorous assurance process to make sure that they meet the criteria and that it is safe for patients to go through that. As soon as they finish that assurance process, they are opened within a few days. And that's one of the reasons we struggle to give you an idea of which sites are opening and when they open, because we don't always get them to the end. Some sites have gone through the process and not made it, so to speak. So the list does change. Um, we will continue doing that over the next couple of months. So I anticipate there will be a lot more sites. The East of England has taken a slightly different approach to most of the rest of England in that we're going for a local offer to make sure that people can get to their centres. A lot of regions have taken the, the stance that they will offer very, very big sites and you'll have to travel to them. We have a very large geography, quite a lot of rural area, and we need to make sure people can reach our sites. So we're doing that through the combination of your local PCN and vaccination centres and your community pharmacy, as well as your hospital hubs. Second doses will start from the week after next, which believe it or not will be then 11 weeks from when we first started on the 8th of December, vaccinating at Milton Keynes Hospital and Cambridge and um, MSC Trust in Essex. We have um, prioritised housebound visits this week, which the snow has made a little difficult, but we are still getting out and trying to make sure we get to as many of those that are housebound as possible. We're doing incredibly well on the 75 to 79 year olds with only hundreds left to vaccinate across the whole region. Care homes do remain our priority and it has been tricky to get in where there is an outbreak, but we have a very good um, risk related process to get in and make sure that we can do that safely for both the staff and the patients and those going in. So that will continue right through the programme to make sure that they remain our top priority. As soon as we can get in and vaccinate patients, we will get in and do so. We have had vaccine hesitancy, so we're engaging with key influencers to try and make sure that is um, nipped in the bud, so to speak. Interestingly, it's some of our younger people, um, especially younger females in care homes and in health and social care workers that seem to have the biggest hesitancy. We've got um, very high take-ups overall in the um, in the older age groups and in those that are clinically extremely vulnerable and we're vaccinating those now. We're planning for cohort six, which is quite a difficult cohort to reach because it's all those that are at moderate risk of disease. So there's a lot of planning being going on for that over the last couple of weeks. And you'll see that start to play out shortly. The snow has slowed us down a bit, particularly across the coastal areas and in, in Suffolk and North East Essex, but we don't think that's going to prevent us from hitting our target. We've been doing incredibly well in those areas. In terms of community pharmacy, we have, as I said, 17 sites so far, but we plan on bringing as many more as we can on board. That will not be immediately. There will be a process to go through and we're working closely with our systems around what we need and where we need it to make sure we've got the capacity so that as vaccine supply increases, we can deliver that supply across the region. And in case we're interested, we have 32 vaccination centres now open, which is the most of any region. And I'll pass over to you for, for any questions. Thanks, Tiffany. That's really, really helpful. And I think, I mean, the, the, the general message back would be a big thank you to, to you and all your staff and colleagues for what's looking like a really, really impressive job. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'll take any questions anyone wants to either put in the chat or um, try and raise hands, which I'll try and spot. Um, I, I, I just got a question, which um, I mean, obviously, as elected representatives, we have um, a, a number of councillors and other colleagues on the call. We have constituents coming to us with concerns, and throughout the advice we've been given is to advise people not to um, to, to keep phoning their GPs um, because it just adds to the, to the problems and advise them to be patient, which I think is good advice and has been borne out. But my understanding is it's, it, the system is now turning around in the sense of the over 70s, but people can now um, uh, go and, and seek a, a, vaccine, a, a vaccine rather than waiting to be called. And the reason, and the, my question I suppose is twofold. One is um, the, the explanation for this earlier was that the constraints were really around the supply. Um, has, has that now tipped? Is the supply now sufficient to mean it can be a demand system more? Um, and secondly, 
um, I was slightly surprised that there wasn't a kind of parallel system for people to actually raise concerns because that seemed to be a separate thing from the medical side. I just wondered whether you could comment on either of those and I'll look for others if they've got any questions. Mm -mm. So in terms of has the system tipped, not really. What we think we've done is we've vaccinated, we think we've offered to everyone in cohorts one to four, but clearly some people may not be registered with a GP, for example, may not be on our record. So it's really just a belt and braces approach to have got to the end of what we think is cohort one to four. We think we've offered everybody and it's then opening it up and making sure that anybody that thinks that they're in those cohorts can phone up and arrange an appointment and we've given both a national number or contact your GP. There were a lot of phone calls on Monday, um, but they were mostly from people that were not eligible in these groups. So the message to these groups is still wait for us to call you. GPs do not have the ability to take ridiculous numbers of phone calls about people that want their vaccine now. They are getting through the list, their own patient list, as quickly as they can. They're phoning people, they're doing it in mm. priority order. So people will be called forward. We have been incredibly successful at managing it across the different delivery models in the East of England, and I, I think we will continue to do so. In terms of raising concerns, there are standard processes that we have available um, that you can raise concerns. You can raise them directly through your, uh, your CCG, which is probably the, the highest level you can go to. You can complain to your, your, your primary care practice. You can complain to your local hospital, or if you go to a vaccination center, you can complain to the trust that runs that. There are all these processes available for people if they, if they have any concerns. Very good, thanks, that's very helpful. Now I don't see, um, oh yes, I see Linda's got, got a hand up. Linda? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, I think the uh, advice from, or the recommendation from government changed earlier in the week, such that employers were asked to encourage their employees uh, to uh, go for vaccination uh, if you had more than 50. Um, how can we, how can the uh, businessmen, businesswomen on this call, um, help with that vaccination rollout? I think where we've got health and social care workforce, it, it really does help if employers can identify if anybody hasn't presented the vaccination. I think all of you on this call can really help as trusted individuals, key influencers. I think it's about making sure that wherever we've got a key influencer for every age group and every cohort, that we get them involved in telling people that this is a great thing to do this will help protect you this will help protect your family this will help to protect people that you walk past in the street and help us get back to normal sooner rather than later so i think i think the onus is on all of you as well as us to try and persuade people that this is the right thing to do and that's why we've started engaging with key influences predominantly through local authorities and local communities to make sure that the message is getting through as much as possible. And I know that our comms leads across both the NHS and the local authorities are working closely together on this. That's great. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We did think it was useful um, to have someone from the NHS um, at this, this critical time just to update people. So thank you ever so much for that. I don't see any more questions at the moment. Um, so we can let you get back to your, your important work. Um, I will just um, sum up unless there are any other additional points or questions that anyone wants to make on the on the inquiry um, by saying uh, again echoing um, Peter's thanks to our speakers today but also um, alerting you again to the, the the next stages in this process the next one on March the 24th being around green travel and better connectivity and I was delighted to hear from Steve that we got Matt Warman um, uh, Matt came into Parliament at the same time as me and has steeped in the tech background so he, he knows his subject very very well so I think he'll be very interesting and helpful I think it'd be very useful for us from the East um, to register uh, with him uh, the issues that we have. Also um, we'll be talking about um, low carbon vehicles and hydrogen buses and I, I, I was very struck at the launch um, of the Freeport East presentation the other day just um, how, how hydrogen is, is is, is coming up um, uh, the agenda very, very rapidly. And I think, again, it's very important that the East of England stakes out its claim um, for the future hydrogen economy. I saw Joe Bamford was on that call, and of course he's a, he's a key player in this sector. So lots of possibilities. Um, I think very important 
that we get our messages across. And then um, the, the following one on in May on net zero infrastructure, we'll have more details for that uh, nearer the time. So thank you all very much today. Thank you to Steve and Devo Connects for um, making these events happen. Thank you all for uh, supporting us on this. Um, I think we've come a very, very long way since this group was established a few years ago and really important uh, that we get the East's priorities across to government. So thank you all. Um, stay safe, have a good day, and hopefully see you at the next meeting.